Welcome everyone. We have our Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds and we are very fortunate to have a speaker with a most interesting topic <laughs> that we look, so. <laughs> we look forward to hearing about. Dr. Douglas Lane is a clinical geriatric psychologist with the Geriatrics and Extended Care Service of the VA Puget Sound System. He is clinical assistant professor in our Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. In the past, he has served on the VA National Working Group on Behavioral Interventions for Dementia and is now on the VA National Working Group for Medication Use in VA long-term care units. He is also a 2011 teaching scholar of the American Psychoanalytic Association. Dr. Lane completed his PhD in clinical psychology through the University of Kansas and is board certified in clinical psychology by the American Board of Professional Psychology. Dr. Lane completed his residency through Eisenhower Army Medical Center and served as an active duty officer in the United States Army Medical Department from 1999 to 2003 which was followed by completion of a postdoctoral fellowship at the Yale University School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry. His work is in the application of contemporary psychodynamic ideas to understanding the subjective experience of dementia and deriving supportive interventions thereby. Dr. Lane, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, and, and thank you very much for having me. I, I work with this material with uh, a variety of disciplines, but it's always nice to be playing to the home team. Uh, so thank you very much. Let me make sure I... There we go. Um, as as uh, was, was kindly introduced, I'm a, a clinical geropsychologist with the VA. Um, probably important to note that I'm not a psychoanalyst. Uh, I'm not trained as an analyst at all. Uh, theoretically, I'm actually what's considered an integrationist. Uh, and so I'm bringing this material not as someone who uh, is wedded only to it, but as someone who has found it helpful with this particular population in trying to understand what's happening with them uh, and then thereby helping intervene. Um, I will be using some clinical data uh, from some landmark cases during my career uh, that is declassified. Uh, but I will try to include that. Um, at the VA, I work at the American Lake Campus, and we are sort of the shady backyard of the VA Puget Sound. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of like working in Mayberry sometimes. Um, but we're in Lakewood, uh, south of Tacoma, uh, and our, the hospital was designed and built in the 20s as a neuropsychiatric rehabilitation facility. And it continues in a lot of ways in that vein. We're primarily a long-term care facility. Um, I work there in uh, our long-term care unit, um, extended care nursing facility, uh, which includes a number of uh, people with dementia that we take care of uh, in our general wards as well as in our uh, dementia special care unit, which is a, a locked uh, unit for people who have dementia but also have significant behavioral problems uh, or wandering issues. Um, I also work with these folks, though, uh, through the geriatric medicine outpatient clinic. So I also see outpatients uh, who are working with diagnoses of dementia, often in a, uh, a couple's context. But um, So I kind of see the gamut here. Um, what I want to do, uh, as was said, is, is just talk a little bit today, give you an overview of, of some of the work and the ways that I've found it helpful to use these ideas. Hopefully that can send you away with an idea or two as you, as you go out into your own practice. Um, I find it also helpful to be able to hang or couch what we do within a, a theoretical grounding so we have some sense of why what we're doing is good or bad. Um, and, and then most especially, not only informing our own efforts, but giving us the ability to guide ancillary and affiliated colleagues and staff. Because uh, as you know, taking care of these folks takes a village. Uh, of a variety of different disciplines, and I often find myself being in a position to provide guidance or explanation or insight for, uh, for allied staff, especially for the people uh, right down front on the line, the day-to-day -day bedside providers like the CNAs and the LPNs and those folks. 
as much as we can do to empower them, uh, so much more the better. So, um, whoops. I think that there we go. My cursor keeps showing up up there, and it disappears here. So <laughs> I'm learning as I go. Um, the first core idea in all of this uh, is that this is a palliative care approach. So those of you who are familiar with palliative care medicine in general, this is no different. Um, we know that we can't reverse the majority of dementias. Some, some we can. Uh, if your folate is off, we can fix that. Um, but Alzheimer's disease, dementia, Parkinson's disease, these things don't get any better. So our goal then shifts to palliation um, to help support the, the individual sustain dignity and selfhood and foster their coping as long as possible to mitigate the emotional and behavioral distress that can arise and often does to mourn with the person uh, this is intensely human work uh, and ultimately to say goodbye to them uh, in my role I've been in the position to work with people for an extended time and be with them up to the end of their life uh, and so that's a, a unique facet of this work that I find particularly compelling. Um, I'd like to introduce you to the first of my clinical cases. This is a gentleman um, who was an inpatient, but who would send me, I called them dispatches from the other side. Uh, he would send me notes. He would write notes to me and send them to me through uh, the nursing staff. And I probably have 15 or 20 of these. Uh, we worked together for a couple of probably a year and a half. And, then, and again, keep in mind this is a gentleman who is living inside, in, in an inpatient unit. Uh, I'll call him Mr. S. It is probable that my mind has slipped so far as is seen by myself and others. I don't appreciate the facts as they are laid out. It's possible and probable that my mind has slipped over the edge, but I have not completely lost all communication with most of reality. And receiving these was one of the things that, not, not the only, but one of the, the landmark cases of my career. And what this gentleman taught me about his experience uh, was, one of, was, was one of the experiences that compelled me to try to learn more and more about their subjective experience. Um, so as I say, this is a palliative care approach. Uh, and we took it with this gentleman, which I'll talk more about in a minute. A second core idea, uh, at the heart of all of this is the philosophy that care and dementia has to be person-centered. No matter what we're using, whether if we're using pharmacology, if we're using behavioral intervention, we have to make it person-centered. Um, dementia impacts the whole of the person, uh, not just their cognition. It impacts someone with a unique life story, a unique medical and psychological status, uh, with important uh, uh, current as well as past human and spiritual relationships. And these are the details that we have to know uh, in order to care for them. Uh, as a brief example of this point, not at our VA, but at another VA in the country, they had a gentleman on an inpatient unit who refused to shower. He would become very agitated when they would try to bring him in the shower room. Um, and, of course, they were perplexed. Um, and a very astute CNA ran his chart and was reminded that this person had been a prisoner of war of the Germans in the Second World War and had been deloused. Uh, a delousing chamber is a large room with basically shower head looking things that blows delousing powder and lo and behold their shower room was a, was a fairly large room with shower heads on the wall and she was able to realize that within the context of his history this was a trigger for uh, traces of what was left of a post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, they found a private place for him to shower, problem solved. Um, just an example of how knowing the history is so pivotal sometimes in helping with these, with these folks. Um, as I mentioned, the, the psychodynamic perspective is one of the reasons I find them so helpful with these guys is because they are such person-centered ways of doing things. That theoretical orientation especially is very person-centered. Um, so as my next example of this, does anybody recognize her? This is a trick question. I'll be surprised if anybody does, I'll put it that way. Um, she probably looks like every many little older women that you see in your practices or in the hospital or the clinic or the mall or wherever. Um, this is who she was. Um, she was the first 
licensed captain of large merchant vessels in, in North American history, 1939. She's kind of dishy, too, I think. Uh, um, so she's one of my favorite examples because I think about her. She passed away not too long ago in her 90s, but I can imagine that she had to have uh, very well-developed what we might call uh, processes of ego strength, a very strong sense of herself, very resilient, um, and all of that would be good stuff to be able to bring to bear in, in working with her and trying to help her. Um, I can also imagine she probably wouldn't be somebody who would like being bossed around by the nursing staff either. Um, so, so again, the moral of the story is just to remember that, that the illness is only part of the person's experience, then and now. Um, it's been referred, dementia has been referred to as the great concealer uh, in that it hides the full person from us behind this outer screen of symptoms, which prevents us sometimes from seeing the whole picture. There we go. Um, current therapies, as you all know, I'm talking to the choir here, uh, relies heavily on uh, supportive behavioral therapies and pharmacotherapy. Um, the ideas that I'm bringing are meant to be used, uh, were helpful in addition to those, by no means instead of them. Uh, again, in guiding our own practice, but also in working with staff. Um, you know, again, you're all certainly very well aware of the of the common pharmacologic agents that are used and their benefits as well as, as potential limits. Um, most clinicians are also familiar with the uh, what's referred to as the ABC method of behavioral analysis, the identification for any problem behavior of potential antecedents leading to the behavior and then consequences that facilitate or reinforce uh, that behavior. Let me get my... This just did something funny. Come back. There we go. All right. Um, I'm a bit of a Luddite, so te uh, technology to me is a, sometimes a challenge. Um, and we still use, within the VA, we use the ABC method. We use the pharmacotherapies, just like any other hospital. Um, we use the ABC method in only a positive, supportive way, uh, but certainly we use it. But there is a growing awareness that the emotional and behavioral distresses involved for, for people with dementia can often be understood and palliated using other traditional psychological models, especially in the early stages uh, and making sure we adapt for their cognitive limits. Uh, data has shown that um, some of the standard empirically supported treatments for older adults, for example, CBT, interpersonal psychotherapy for depression, life review and integration, uh, those things can also be helpful for people with in, in the early stages of dementia. Um, some key tasks specifically to address, and that I address, especially in working with these with these folks on the on the shallower end of the pool, um, acceptance of the diagnosis. Um, believe it or not, I've had more than one who walked away with their report <coughs> from neuropsychology and didn't believe it, um, and or they walked away from it, believed it, but put it in the dresser and couldn't look at it for six months. Um, until they got their mind around it. Um, this can range from basic psychoeducation all the way up to potentially very complex family therapy, couples therapy. Um, not The diagnosis doesn't always land in the best environment. Um, have a highly conflicted couple or a, or a torn up family and this just lands on top of that. Um, likewise, monitoring and intervening with any mental health, system, mental health symptoms um, that arise because of the diagnosis or are reactivated from earlier in life following the diagnosis, um, in particular risk issues. We all know that older white males uh, are the highest risk group for suicide. Uh, we see a lot of those in the VA uh, with attendant substance abuse problems and access to weapons. So this is something that we're used to dealing with a lot. Fo immediately following the diagnosis of dementia, suicide risk peaks. Uh, there's a blip. Uh, in it following that diagnosis. So of course we monitor for those things. I, I talk a lot with people about planning for the future and this may be very pragmatic stuff like contact an elder law attorney, think about your advanced directives, think about your will, think about um, final wishes, but also um, hopefully more vitally uh, I'm very fond of the phrase, what do you want to do with this phase of your life? And I found that actually, it's a simple phrase, but I found it to catch some people off guard because it's very common for these folks to get their diagnosis and assume that's it. My book is over. 
we're on that last blank page at the back that doesn't have anything written on it. And so to simply say, what do you want to do with this part of your life, can, can be a bit of a change in zeitgeist for them. Um, it, this can include a lot of accelerated, unfortunately, end-of-life work, the kind of things that hopefully we would be able to do with more time. Um, working, if you go back to your Ericksonian stages, to the late-life developmental crises, for example, resolving a sense of integrity versus despair. The dementia can complicate this, which is, which is hard to do, or makes it hard to do. With Mr. S, um, I spent a lot of time with him describing his experiences, and I used to tell him, you know, I'm your best student. And I really worked and framed him as a teacher for me in many ways, um, and he liked that, and he went with that. And so that was part of our relationship in giving him some meaning uh, and some sense of purpose. Uh, that he was now teaching me, and I told him so that I can help other people try to understand what it's like for you. Um, we often take a sort of a coping with chronic illness model approach to this, the same sort of work you might do with someone with, with COPD that's learning to live life in spite of it, um, and literally sometimes thinking about how to be as someone with dementia. And this can take, again, very concrete form. This can be how do you go to the Christmas party and deal with the fact that you may have memory gaps? What do you want to have prepared to say to people? You know, who do you want to tell about this illness? Who do you not want to tell? Um, it can it can be as, as down to earth as that, which is part of why I like the work. Sometimes it's it's just very deeply human. Um, likewise, helping the person understand the idea of making the best of it. And one of the uh, articles that I I think the department distributed to everybody then, those were just in case interesting to anyone, is called Making the Best of It. Um, and that's a real, it's a very rehab-oriented approach, and even though this is a palliative approach, it's very valid, because as we know, most of the dementias play out over years. Um, there's time, there's things that are left, there's things that can be done. And I'm very fond of telling patients, I don't care if the glass is a quarter full, we can still put Ovaltine in it and make it chocolate. Uh, for as long as we can. Can you tell I have a two-year-old? Um, so, And lastly, I talk with them about forming a core group, which is family, friends, doctors, social workers, doesn't matter, whoever it is, pastors, people who can be with them and, and coalesce around them in these years and the years to come so that when the time comes, they have the support, they have people who are familiar, who've been working with them for years, and that can include me if they want me there um, uh, as time comes. So it, it really, it does take a village, and the village, I think, needs to form early on in the process as soon as it's identified, um, even in more advanced illness. Uh, I've been talking about early on, but even as we get into the middle and deeper end of the pool, um, we have data that's demonstrated that psychosocial care uh, can play a role in helping to reduce need for antipsychotics for example, uh, in, in people with dementia. Um, and this, in fact, is the heart of the movement now within the VA, is to enhance psychosocial care as much as possible um, and minimize psychotropic use when possible and achieve a, a balance there. Uh, okay. Whoops. What did I do? There we go. Okay. Um, why didn't it? Let's try this. There we go. Um, so speaking a little bit about the subjective experience of the person with dementia, um, and I want you all to think in terms of neurologic processes underlying all of this, because this is th these are theoretical uh, constructs, these are heuristics based in what we know our brain does. Um, human consciousness, our consciousness now, uh, in this moment exists um, beyond moment-to-moment -moment processing because we have an intact, very complex system of memory um, that allows us to replay things, uh, interactions with others, events, developing a personal narrative. Um, it's what uh, in, the, in the dynamic world is sometimes called the autobiographical self. Um, it's a higher order manifestation of what neuropsychologists would refer to as episodic memory. Um, it is subjectively that sense that we all have, which is that you know, we were here today, um, we did something, we heard something, uh, you know, others were here, this hopefully meant something, um, and, and somehow fits in our, our 
prior experience and what comes next, and it all weaves together. Um, that decays in dementia uh, as the underlying neurologic and cognitive processes decay. Um, this higher order sense of autobiographical self decays as well. Um, so there's a there's a, re, uh, a common term or a common idiom in in the dementia world that the core loss in dementia is the loss of self. Uh, and I have a book later I'll give you the reference for called the lost self. Um, so above all else, uh, we literally lose who we are. Uh, we lose that internal sense of self-organization, of connection to others, and a sense of continuity. It's what literally someone uh, has described as the sense of losing your mind. Um, okay, so let me... Ah. My... The arrow keeps shifting over. There we go. Okay. Um, furthermore... Um, Part of our autobiographical self is an overlearned set of, of language and memory-based uh, constructs, what in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy might be referred to as cognitive appraisals, that allow us to rise above what's referred to as primary consciousness. I feel, I want, I don't like. Um, these, these structures allow us to develop what's referred to as secondary consciousness. Well, I feel this because of that. And, and I can either do this or that about it, but I probably shouldn't do this other thing. Um, again, often what we're working with in, in a way of thinking about what we're working with in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, likewise, this decays uh, as the dementia process moves out. So in some, uh, the, the subjective experience for someone with dementia uh, is, is a, a loss of that autobiographical sense of self such that their existence does become moment to moment disconnected pages of different books uh, and there is often a regression into the, pri uh, the, the, the level of primary consciousness. Um, as, a, as an example of this, I, I interacted with a gentleman who had survived the depression and been a POW and in both occasions experienced significant starvation. And uh, I met him on our unit. He had just checked in, just, just uh, been signed in and and I said, well, you know, well, it's dinner time. Why don't we go to the dining room? I said, the last thing we want is to have anybody not have enough to eat here. And he, he looked at me. He stopped and looked at me and said, I've been hungry before. But he had no idea where that came from. He had that momentary awareness that he had experienced hunger before, but he couldn't put it together with why, where it came from, how it related to now. Um, and so I took him to eat, and he ate well. So... Um, Narrowing the focus a little bit, um, due to the neurologic changes, the person with dementia also experiences a loss of what we have classically referred to as ego functions. Um, these are interdependent uh, abilities. They're, they're neurologically mediated. They're neuropsychological in their nature. Um, as such, they're very vulnerable to dementia. Um, just by way of a brief review, are, are there any psychology interns in the house? Okay couple of them, yeah, you guys don't get a lot of this anymore, so <laughs> um, I know because I, yeah, um, so just by way of a brief review, we talk about th the ego's ability to reality test, which is to distinguish between what's going on inside and outside and what's real and what's not, um, the ability to manage impulses, to, to rise above uh, primary consciousness and manage impulses and not just automatically discharge them. Um, Affect regulation or the ability to hold and modulate powerful emotion without being overwhelmed. Um, what's referred to sometimes as judgment, which this is, this is classic executive function stuff. Uh, the ability to consider options given a, a, a particular situation, decide which one is going to be best based on potential outcomes, choose that option and then adjust based on feedback. Um, the deployment of defenses. Uh, which is the ability to protect yourself emotionally from some sort of powerful, overwhelming, threatening state or emotion or feeling. Uh, these develop even in infancy. Um, and again, I think I mentioned I have a two-year-old. Um, I see denial around my house every day. Um, Want to watch Sesame Street? Well, we just watched Sesame Street. No, we didn't. Well, yeah, we did. No, we didn't. And I hear this little thing in there who can't tolerate the reality of 
the fact that Sesame Street is now over, <laughs> insisting that it, we never did it. You know, um, hopefully these things evolve and become more complex as we grow and get older. Hopefully, not always. Um, so that adults maintain more complex methods of defense, quite healthy methods of defense. Humor, for example. Uh, one of my current outpatients on his own likes to tell me one of the things that he likes about, he says, one of the things I like about having Alzheimer's disease is all the new people I get to meet. <laughs> um, and that's his way of coping. He's using humor to cope, and I, I accept that. That's the way he wants to do it. Um, we talk about th another ego function being thought process, which is just the ability, the person's ability to maintain their thought processes along a linear track. So when you do your mental status exam and you say thought process is linear, logical, and goal-directed, that's what we're talking about. Um, and then perhaps the most complex, the, the synthetic function of the ego, which is just that ability to organize all of our functions, all of the information that's coming in at, the, at one time, physically, psychologically, emotionally, cognitively, to integrate that into a coherent sense of, of current state and self. And lastly, the one that I think is the most poignant uh, in terms of where we can intervene on a day-to-day -day basis for these folks are object relations, which is the capacity to form a mutually satisfying relationship. This is not what happens when you talk to the, ch the, the checkout person at, at Costco. This is what happens, and you know that it's there when you hit those hard moments of your life and you hear that person's voice in your head telling you things that will get you through. That tells you you know, that you've got someone interjected, you've got someone with a significant object relationship there. Um, so moving specifically into the area of object relations, we know um, that our need for connectedness to other people is a fundamental human need. We are, we are herd animals. Uh, if you look at us, um, I love comparative psychology, if you look at us um, as, as evolutionarily driven animals, as all other animals are, um, and you look back at our history, you'll find that one of the significant points in our development was when we started flocking together um, and, and moving in groups, and they found fossilized remains of, of it's not me, thankfully. Um, that would have been really embarrassing. Um, fossilized remains of people who uh, had evidently, based on the forensic anthropology, had significant illnesses and been cared for by other members of the group, and these are, we're talking Neanderthal level folks. So we're herd animals, that's, that's how we exist. This is a survival mechanism um, as fundamental as eating and drinking and sleeping. Um, we know a lot, a lot of research has been done in infants uh, regarding attachment styles, the result of lack of attachment, um, the old term of uh, anaclytic depression, anybody familiar with that? Some people may be. The notion of what happens to infants the way they wither and decay in an environment where they don't have an opportunity to attach. That's why babies are so cute. Um, you just want to go to them and take care of them. You know. um, beyond that, though, um, the existence of these kinds of relationships is what gives our sense of us, our sense of presence and identity and, and humanness. Um, relationships are our natural habitat, and identity and selfhood is reciprocally determined. So who I am is in relation to my wife, my daughter, my supervisees, um, my dog, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and this need uh, remains intact for a long time, a long time, even into advanced uh, dementia. We know that we possess very complex multimodal neural networks that are oriented towards social cognition. Um, the concept of mirror neurons uh, is just one example, if you're familiar with the research on mirror neurons. Um, but the difficulty in dementia is that because of the memory losses, there is a loss of what's referred to as object constancy. I don't even know if my wife is still alive. I don't know if I have a wife. If I see her, I don't know who she is. Um, therefore, I can't evoke her. Um, you know, I, I know my wife is at work right now at Western State, and uh, I'll talk to her when this is over and we'll plan where we're going to get takeout tonight. Um, but if I have dementia, I can't do that. Um, so as a result, these folks are at high risk for um, interpersonal and emotional abandonment. Um, um, not intentionally, 
but without realizing it. Um, they get emotionally and, and interpersonally abandoned by others. Um, so this is why our presence and the presence of our staff and families and caregivers, the people that we guide, is so, is so critical because we can become a new self-object, uh, an ego prosthesis is, is what the term has been called uh, by some. Um, especially important because uh, normally our construction, your construction and mine of, of experience toggles back and forth between first and third person. I and you, again, it's reciprocally determined. But when the first person begins to fail, the third person has to be there to pick up the slack. So literally, how we interact with them, even on a day-to-day -day basis down on the wards, um, can determine a lot about their subjective experience. And I'll, I'll go back to Mr. S, who had some aphasia, clearly not enough that he couldn't write and he couldn't express himself, but he would have um, anomic aphasic periods or word-finding gaps and these were frustrating for him and he was a fairly large guy and he would raise his voice ah, you know, in frustration. And we had some staff who did not understand what was happening. And they would, they would react and they would pull away from him in those moments. And he wrote to me one day um, on his own, uh, one of the saddest things about this malady is when I speak up when people are around, everyone runs when I raise my voice or move too quick. This is really sad for me and those around me. And so this stood out for me as an example of this, this gentleman's reality, his structure of reality, as well as of himself. Again, this is reciprocally determined. This is a fellow with advancing dementia who still has a sense of himself and now has a sense of himself as a monster. Um, which he did not want. That was one of his fears earlier in the illness was, am I going to turn into that? You know, the people who are swinging and hitting and all sorts of things like that. Um, fortunately, he was able to move beyond this, but it, it was just a very poignant example to me. Um, so we talked sometime about the concept of transitional objects. And again, this is something that we're most familiar with in the, in the realm of children. My daughter has about 30 of them. Um, it's, it's sort of the transitional object du jour. It's just, you know. Um, but just as important as giving a sense of humanity, and uh, these kinds of relationships um, serve a holding function. Uh, not unlike what happens in psychotherapy when they talk about the holding function in therapy, the holding environment for emotion. And again, these are folks who are losing the ego ability to modulate emotions on their own, to understand them, etc. That is me, and I'm going to ignore that. Um, so as the illness um, progresses, uh, and they can no longer do this, they need us. Um, again, that related, attached relationship in order to be able to help them do this. Um, and this need can be even anticipated, potentially, in the years before, and precursor objects established. Um, people, uh, or even objects, specific things that help um, in, in, a, in a basic way can be classically conditioned uh, to soothe the person, but then later um, in the illness be brought back out um, to, to give them something to continue to relate to on a higher level, simply to relate to and have a sense of connection to. Um, I have a gentleman now uh, who is, is, for whom I'm a transitional object. I interacted with him grand total of about eight hours a uh, year and a half ago uh, when he was with us on a, a respite stay. And I like to think I'm a nice guy, but eight hours is not a lot of time. Um, but he came back to stay with us uh, around the time of his spouse passing. And he was clearly very attached to me, asking for me, wanting to see me. And um, clearly there was a lot of affect and emotion and stuff going on that was well beyond anything that I did in eight hours worth of contact. And he says to me a lot, he says, you knew my wife. You knew my wife, didn't you? you? And I did. I met her and spoke with her. I said, I do, I did. You know, and it became evident that he's using me as a transitional object to his wife and that I can soothe him because you, you knew her. And he reinforces that every time I see him. You knew my wife. You knew my wife. Uh, and it's very powerful. And it's, um, if anybody's familiar with the work of Dr. Searles, uh, this goes way back. He spent a lot of time just listening to the delusional content of people with psychosis. Um, 
it is what it is, but sometimes you can really take away pearls when you do that. Um, and I, I find the same thing here with these folks. Um, S-E-A-R-L-E-S, I think. Yeah. Um, and I believe I've got the name right. Uh, and I know I've got my pointer in the wrong place here. Um, so when, whoops, when we get to the point of working on inpatient units specifically, um, there's a gentleman by the name of Kit Wood who did a lot of work looking at the institutional environment, the institutional milieu, um, and looking at the ways that this can dehumanize, of course, which we knew, but when done right, can humanize. And he talked a lot about what he referred to as the malignant social psychology of inpatient units. And this can apply to psychiatric units as well as, as uh, uh, dementia care units, but what happens is in the absence of um, these kinds of inter interrelationships, even simple ones with, with staff, even the most basic relationships where they aren't even able to really remember who you are or what you do, but you've got this halo around you so that they know when they're with you they feel okay, even that has value. Even someone who's aphasic and can't speak, it has value. Um, we know that when they don't have that, um, then what happens is the same thing that happened with an anaclytic depression with an infant. They wither, they pull away, they shrink, uh, and, and I heard one researcher put it in terms of when faced with that lack of attachment, the body essentially prepares to die. Um, so again, having an environment that, that is interpersonally supportive and stimulating where there are relationships for attachment that are, that are available uh, is key to taking care of these folks. And the absence of them, among other things, can, can um, cue a lot of difficult behaviors which we then get called to deal with. Um, so last thing I wanted to talk about were just some of the therapist factors that I think are pretty helpful in working with this population. Um, oh, I'm going to get that arrow one of these days. Now what did I do? There we go. Um, First, I think, and, and this is even a little Rogerian, but you have to have just a, an unquestioning trust that this person is going to have an inherent drive towards health that's going to continue to reveal itself some way or another. Um, my last little note from, that I have with me from Mr. S, um, again, he did everything he could to try to maintain a sense of meaning and purpose, um, that drive towards health that was, that was uh, manifesting itself. He, he wrote me one day, he said, I've done everything I can think of to get more attention for dementia of all sorts. And he asked me one day, he said, do they, basically he asked me if we had dementia research going on at American Lake, which we do. We have a regional GREC, which is a geriatric research education and clinical center, huge research enterprise in dementia. And I said, yeah, we do. I said, right here. He said, tell them to get off their butt. <laughs> so I did. No, I didn't. Um, said, please now give me a chance to learn all I can about this bastard disease. My spelling and other crazy things are happening to make this far more difficult than necessary, but you can do me a ton of help and information by answering my questions. Please, I need help. Please let me help you. So this is this gentleman's drive towards health exerting itself. Um, and kind of as you might Im imply there, you have to prioritize the relationship over any other intervention. Um, so this is not work that lends itself to a manualized CBT program for anxiety. Um, and you have to be comfortable with that as a, as a therapist, uh, as a clinician. Um, you have to be open to not knowing. I don't know what I'm going to get when I walk on the ward today. And also with a lack of reciprocity. You have to be comfortable with working with someone who can't give you because let's face it, we're all therapists. We love it when a patient says, oh, that was a great interpretation, you know, or that was so helpful last session. We, lo we love that stuff. Um, we need it. We don't get it always here. And you have to kind of be comfortable with that. Um, I mentioned the, the importance of the glass half full approach. Um, critical not only for the patient to pick up that you believe in that, but also for your own self-care for you to believe in that. Um, on the other side of it, knowing that there are going to be some things you can't change and being comfortable working with things that are unmovable and unchangeable 
and understanding that sometimes the smallest changes are worth making because they make something a little bit better. Um, you have to be ready to, as I say, you, you never know, and, uh, and sometimes what you get may be a little unsettling, like I went on the ward one day and Mr. S walked right up to me, put his hands on his hips and said, hello, meathead. Um, well, hello. Um, how are you today? Uh, you have to be ready to roll with that stuff because you, you just never know. Uh, it's, it's a box of chocolates. Um, it requires what's been referred to as a radical authenticity. Um, so when the person says, have you ever been scared? Yeah, I have been. You know, as opposed to taking the classic sort of, well, what does that mean to you kind of reaction? Because for these folks, they aren't going to understand that and it's probably going to repel them um, within limits, uh, always within limits. But sometimes being just really authentic is what they need. Um, they need a lot of compassion. And they need it genuinely. One of the things these, these, uh, this illness does not take away is the person's ability to spot a line of bull or an insincere person. Uh, they can tell. Uh, they really can. And sometimes you have to be able to play with them to, you know, to, to, when they want to play, so to speak, to joke, to use levity, to, to laugh with them uh, when they say, all the new people I get to meet. You know, to be able to laugh at that uh, in, a, in a therapeutic way. Um, it requires a lot of distress tolerance. Uh, Mr. Mr. S ultimately declined medically, was admitted to hospice, and passed away. Um, and I wish I could say that's the only patient I've had who that was the course, but it's not. And it won't be the, the last one. Um, and so being able to work with that is, is necessary. It's such a, it, takes a, it takes good self-care. It really does, because this can be very stressful work, including insight into your own countertransferences. Um, there's a couple that are so common they have names. Uh, one of them is the parental tr countertransference, where we find ourselves beginning to try to overparent um, our own patients, uh, being paternalistic or too controlling or whatnot. Uh, the other is called the it'll happen to me or what if it happens to me countertransference, which is I, I have a student, um, uh, he and I were, were just talking about this uh, in, uh, in uh, didactics this idea that sometimes clinicians, me, um, you, go, you go home with that feeling of, oh my heavens, what if that happens to me? Um, I, I talked with a, a family member yesterday who called me to say, uh, you know, another family member came to see my dad. It, it, it upset my dad more than it did anything. It took him hours to get him settled down. It upset my other family member. What should we do? And in the conversation she said, I just wish he could still be my dad. Uh, and I said, he is. And uh, I, I said, you know, I'm a father, and, and I want my daughter to always know that no matter what my state is, I love her. I'm always her dad. And I went home and started thinking about, now, how am I going to get that out there for her? Um, and so it, it makes you think about your own self uh, and your own life and your own world in a, in a unique way. Um, you have to be careful with these folks not to become another loss. Um, so, you know, you might take on a patient, for example, for three months, to treat a fairly circumscribed depression because you can go a long way in three months to do that. One of these folks, maybe not necessarily because in three months you're leaving um, and they're going to be still there and um, you could easily become another loss and so you realize you have to take that into account in working with them. Um, and I think most fundamentally you have to be a, a, a good colleague and you have to have good colleagues. This work is rough. Uh, all of our work is tough. Um, none of us are cowards, that's why we don't shy away from it. But what matters is who you do the work with uh, more than anything, and we have a, a really neat group down at American Lake. Um, we also have the newest long-term care unit in the entire VA system. We have the Crown Jewel, and if anyone ever would like to see it, email me, call me, I'm happy to set up a tour. Um, it is based on what the VA refers to as a culturally transformed environment of care. It's, it, person-centered, it fosters a home-like environment. The place to me looks like a hotel. Um, it's, it's got a real northwest kind of feel to it, carpet on the floor, soft lighting, lots of woodwork, um, and uh, it's a nice place, and it makes a big difference, uh, I think, for how we take care of our patients. But um, So I wanted to just lastly uh, see if you had any questions that I can answer. Yes, ma'am. I did, yeah. I can't thank you enough. I mean, that was such an asset 
Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad, you know, and, and it, it wasn't actually my idea. Uh, I wish, no, it was, yes. Let's say, let's say that. Let's say it was my idea. Yes, it was my idea. Um, also, the internet was my idea. No, um, um, yeah, the people who set up the conference, uh, I said, if I have any handouts or whatnot, and she said, just send them as an attachment and we can distribute it. Saves trees um, and people can pick and choose. So I'm glad. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or anything? Because the other thing I'll leave you with, because um, I know we're up on close to time, um, these are just some resources that I find helpful. These are not the be-all, end-all by any respect. Um, the top is an organization known as, it's called the International Neuropsychoanalysis Society. Um, it's, in a nutshell, predicated on the understanding that neurology and psychiatry are coming together again, that neuroscience is informing more and more of how we understand our psychological self, our, our theory of mind, our sense of humanity. Um, this is a fairly recent organization. It's got uh, Robert Sachs is on the board, um, some fairly significant folks. Uh, it's based in England, but uh, physically it, it uh, is housed in uh, the uh, Analytic Institute in New York City and, and at Cornell, well, Cornell. Um, so they have a nice website and whatnot. The next uh, three things are some books that, again, that I find very helpful. The Lost Self by Feinberg and Keenan. Um, another nice one called The Brain in the Inner World by a neuropsychologist named Mark Solms and another named Oliver Turnbull. Um, and then the third one, The Executive Brain by uh, a neuropsychologist named Elkanen Goldberg. Uh, for those who are neuropsychology nerds like I am, he trained under Luria, under Alexander Luria, so he goes back a ways. Um, and then me, and I put my email down there uh, in case I can ever ask and answer any questions or whatever. Um, I love this stuff. I do a, um, um, a well, within the American Psychological Association, which is kind of our a AMA, um, we have um, subsections, and there's one, the Society for Clinical Geropsychology, and I do a, um, a reading group, so to speak, uh, over, over a telephone conference once every month or so, Anybody's interested, I'm happy to send you the articles. It's all about dynamic applications with uh, older adults, um, which we've stirred up a lot of interest. Who knew it was there? Uh, so anyway, but thank you very much for your time. I guess let me just wish you a happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I, I'll leave you with the best, ad most mentally healthy advice I've gotten in months, which is my daughter has invented a Christmas carol lay down Christmas, take a nap. Um, and I thought, regardless of someone's traditions or faith traditions, that's really good advice. So, happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you.